All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to Comp 3350 Software Engineering. I hope that you all had. Uh, I hope you all had a really good weekend. I hope you all had a great weekend. I, uh, you know, personally, in a really unrelatable way, I'm feeling exhausted because my kid keeps waking me up at night, telling me that he wants me to tuck him in, which. It's adorable, sort of, except when it happens every night at around 2 a.m. And uh, yeah, yeah, so super unrelatable. I'm glad that we could all get that uh, that shared information. All right. I want to I wanna really wrap up this uh, non-technical planning artifacts thing. And the way that I want to wrap up this non-technical planning artifacts thing is by just spending a little bit of time making decisions as teams, whether or not uh, certain terms are technical terms. So relating back to our idea of user stories being written by our users and trying to avoid the use of technical terms. I've got a bunch of terms that I've kind of listed and I wanna see what your opinion is. There's not really a right answer or a wrong answer to these questions. It's more of a poll, but I just wanna see where everybody stands and what, uh, what, what we think about it. And then I want to ask um, some questions about uh, success criteria. So that's one of the things that we've omitted a little bit from our discussion in class, but is part of the vision document that you're putting together. And one of the key things about success criteria are that they should be measurable and objective. And so I've written down some success criteria and we're going to decide whether or not these are measurable and objective success criteria to give you a sense of the kinds of success criteria that you should be writing into your own vision documents. If you, uh, if you haven't noticed this already, uh, right beside iteration zero on the course webpage, there's a sample vision. Uh, for a system that's called SRSYS. This, uh, this is actually a long running sample project for this course that goes back to profs that I had when I took this course. Uh, it's a long running vision that's been brought forward basically from a Java app, like a command line Java app, all the way up to an Android app. And what I really like about this is that well, for one thing, I don't have to relearn the sample project because it's the same sample project that I had when I was a student. But um, it's kind of cool because it's well designed and it's been able to be taken from this command line Java app all the way up to this modern-ish Android application. So SRSYS, this is an example of a good vision document. This is what I would qualify as a good vision document. So when you're looking for examples or looking for things that you should be including in your own vision statement and vision document for your projects, that's a good place to, to find an example of what that looks like. After that, I'd like us to start preparing some technical planning artifacts. Non-technical and technical planning artifacts are two different types of documents that are mainly distinguished by the people that are creating them. So some of the things that we're calling technical planning documents and planning artifacts in this class, they're not, they're not code. They're not technical in the sense that there's some kind of like relationship to actual technical stuff. It's more like we as a dev team or as a project manager are responsible for creating those artifacts. So the specific one that I'm thinking of that doesn't really seem super technical is release planning. And this is where we're deciding where to put user stories as we're going through the process of building this project up. There's nothing technical about this. There's nothing technical about this, but we call it a technical planning artifact because of who creates it. And it's usually going to be somebody like a project manager or a team collectively working together to create it. The other technical planning artifact that we're going to look at is technical. It's very technical. This is an architecture diagram. And we're going to talk a little bit about software architecture broadly, and then I'm just going to tell you which architecture you are going to use for this project, and you don't, you don't have a choice. You're not going to be making choices about which architecture to use. I'm just going to tell you this is what you're using for building software in this course. All right, so our non-technical planning artifacts consist of vision, which is that super, super high level description of what our project does. We break that vision down into these features or epics. These are broad categories of things that our users ultimately need to be able to do to accomplish the vision. 
but they're still way too big for us to do anything about in terms of building code, writing code. So we break that down even further into user stories. All of these non-technical planning artifacts are created by our clients. In this course, we are our own clients, so we are responsible for making all those, but typically you'd have either a product owner in a workplace who's going to be the representative of the client helping you build these things, or actual representatives of the client, or the actual client coming in to help you build these documents. I'd like to, uh, to spend some time taking a look at some technical terms, some things that could be technical terms and decide whether or not they are. I'd like you to do this as teams. So pick one person on your team to be the device holder, and then have, we'll have conversation about each of these terms um, going forward. So please go ahead and, uh, and sign in. All right, so let's get started here. So the first bunch of these are just a pull. There's no points. So you don't have to race, just, just take your time. Okay, good, good, good. I'm glad you all agree with me that that list is a technical term, both from, the, again, the perspective of this is a data structure name or an abstract data type name, but also from, the, I'm, I'm beginning to think about this is the way it's going to look, when in terms of user stories, I don't want to think about how it's going to look. I really just want to know what it's going to do. Again, it's just a poll. You don't have to race. Okay, so good. I'm glad we, we all just collectively agree. Grid, yeah, that's not a data structure or an abstract data type, but in the same way that list is a technical term, we're starting to think about what it's going to look like, and we don't want to think about what it's going to look like yet. So I think this is a technical term, and I'm, I'm glad you all agree. <laughs> all right, so I, our hive mind agrees that this is not a technical term. I don't think this is a technical term. F finding something is, is, is finding something. You're not telling anything about how you're going to find something. You're just, I, I want to find something, period, full stop. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. So there's a, there's a, there's a table. Uh, in the same way, it, to me, to me, in the same way that list is a technical term, table is a technical term. And for both reasons, a table is a kind of data type or data structure. It's also a presentation tool for what you're going to be showing on the screen. So that's my opinion. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to politely ask if the team that said no, they don't think this is a technical term, is brave enough to say why they don't think it's a technical term. And if nobody raises their hands in 10 seconds, I'm just going to move on. So we didn't choose that, but I'm thinking they just saw the image and they're like, oh, it's a table. OK. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe. It might have also been a slip of the finger. OK, I'm going to move on. No shame, by the way. If you see, this, is a, this is a totally just an opinion thing. My opinion's the most important one, though. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. That was uh, that was a lot of answers at the last second. There, I, I'm guessing this was a little more contentious than before. Is filter a technical term? I, I'm a, I am actually going to say eh, it kind of depends. Probably yes. I think that the better way, so when I'm thinking of the word filter, 
I'm trying to say something like, I've got results from a search. I would like to filter them by property X. That's what I want to be able to do. Another way that you could say that is, as a user, whatever kind of user you have in your system, I want to be able to find this by some property name. Filter kind of maybe implies you've got a table, there's filters there. It might imply you've got checkboxes that are going to be used for filtering. It might imply, imply, imply. It might imply all those things. But I'd say that this is getting to be a little bit uncertain in my mind about whether or not this is a technical term. My preference would be to see, I want to be able to find this thing by this property as opposed to I want to be able to filter results. Unless this whole idea of filtering results is a core part of your app. If that's the case, then definitely use this word. But if you're just like, I want to be able to find things using different properties, I want to be able to find things using different properties. Okay, yeah, yeah, good, 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 good. This dog is shopping at my shop. Blowout event, 40% off almost everything. Is user a technical term? I, I'm going to say it's a term you should avoid. I'm going to say you probably shouldn't be using this term in the sense that the user stories that you're writing should be for a specific kind of user. But I don't know if I'd call it a technical term. When, when I'm thinking user, I'm, I'm thinking about specific kinds of people that are using my app. I'm, very spe I'm specifically thinking about different kinds of people that are using my app. But there are more precise ways to describe who is using your app than the word user. So really, generally, you could write all of your user stories from the perspective of a user. But they're going to be better user stories if you were describing who it is. So what kind of a user it is that is responsible for that. So is it a technical term? I don't know, but I'd still say avoid it. I'd still say avoid it, yeah. A customer, that would be kind of in the same thing, a customer and a user. If you just write all of your user stories with the word customer, then it's kind of going to be the same thing. Try to be more precise about the kind of customer that you're, that you're dealing with. If you're building a shop of some kind and everybody's a customer, then maybe start trying to think about different kinds of people that could be shopping at your shop. So like your grandparents or your siblings or um, somebody that's a technical person, like a dev or somebody that's not a technical person. So some person that's not a dev. Okay, so these ones are actually uh, quizzes now. I believe that there are objectively correct answers to these questions. I'm asking you to make decisions now about success criteria. Success criteria are statements that are going to be used to decide whether or not your project was successful by the time you deliver it to your customer. Good success criteria are measurable and objective. Measurable here means you're, you're able to measure it. So like you can have some kind of a pull. You can make observations about the way that people are behaving. You can make observations about the way or the speed at which people can do things with your product and be able to say that it's a certain amount faster or slower or better in some way, shape or form. Objective success criteria are ones that can be stated as facts. So unobjective or subjective success criteria are those that are, uh, it's kind of like your opinion, man. It, it's criteria that you're making statements about that are going to differ from person to person without being an objective fact about what it is that you're trying to build. So I'm going to start these. These are success criteria statements for some products. And your goal is to decide whether or not they are measurable and objective. 
There are four answers to every one of these questions, and you should select two for each one of these questions that you see. So each there's going to be pairs of this is objective, this is not objective, this is measurable, this is not measurable. So you, you should select one each of those um, pairs of things. Okay. As, as stated, as this is stated, the way that it's stated right now, this is not measurable. It's not measurable because we're not saying how we're going to measure it. So as stated, this project is considered successful if the users like it. I don't know how I'm going to find that out. I don't know how I'm going to find that out. It's also not objective because, well, I like certain apps, but you may not like the same app. Why? Why don't you like it? What's wrong with it? What's wrong with you? Why don't you like that app that I like? So to me, this is not measurable and it's not objective. We, we haven't said how we're going to measure it and we haven't said why or uh, objectively how much somebody has to like it more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Purely a semantic argument. Yeah. But I would say that the amount that someone, that a user likes it, is able to be measured. Yes. If we were to rephrase this, so maybe I'll say that, and then you can, you can say again. If I were to rephrase this, so let me rewrite this. This project is considered successful if, in a survey, 30% of users like it more. Or the average amount of like that people have. So we ask 100 of our users and 80% and of them like it more. They say, I prefer this new app compared to the old one. Is that kind of what you're describing? I still disagree. OK. I think if you're just saying how much users like it, well, you could, you could measure that with like, I don't know, five star rating. Five star rating. OK, like so. Like, even if you're not saying how you're measuring it, you still measure how much a user likes So let me rewrite this again. If, if most people, if 80% of my users rate it four stars, does that match what you're describing? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is semantic. You're right. You're right, it's semantic. But I'm qualifying it. That's what I'm trying to do here. So how much more do people like it? Or what is the definition of liking? So if I'm going to say people like it if it's rated four stars out of five on average, then, then that's it. Uh, there was a, yes, yeah. So that's an excellent question. We don't know okay. based on the way that this is stated right now. So if we were to rewrite it and say they're going to rank it four stars out of five, then that, that might be a way to say that it's now more measurable and more objective. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's the same thing. Okay. Good, 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 good. I'm really happy to see that, that we're on the same page. Maybe you don't agree with me, but you agree with what I've told you. You agree? No, no, that's the wrong thing I want to say. You listened to me. You're able to regurgitate what I told you. That's better what I want to say. So this is not objective for the same reason as last time. What does it mean to like it? If we rewrite this and stay, 30% of users rank it four stars out of five, or whatever this was, I think it was out of three stars. So if we have mostly three stars, it's one, three, and then five. OK, so if most people like it more than three. So if on average, 30% of users like it more than three stars out of five, then this is an objective thing that we're measuring. So good. I'm really happy to see that we're, we're on the same page about what I'm expecting to see. I got two more.
Okay, so one thing that I like about this is that this is fairly flat. We all collectively disagree with each other. There's a 20% in there. There is a 20%, and that, that's a bit of a red, a red herring. Red herring means like it's something that looks important, but it actually is just a distraction. It's not actually related to what we're talking about. 20% to when I read it is a red herring that says this is measurable because there's a number there. That's an objective measurable thing. Numbers are objective and measurable and they don't lie. How are we measuring this? We haven't really said how we're measuring this. And the other thing is what does better mean in this case? So similar to the last question, people liking it, we haven't qualified to say what it means for somebody to like it or what it means for our user base to like it more or less than before. We haven't here defined what better means. We haven't said what makes this product better than the thing that it was replacing. If I used words like faster, that, that's beginning to approach measurable and objective as opposed to just better. We can do these things faster. I'd still say how much faster would you consider it to be a success criteria? If you've got something, okay, so Aurora, you got Aurora and you are building new Aurora, better Aurora. Better Aurora is better. Better Aurora is better. If I can get to my class list, if I can get to the classes that I'm registered for this term in two clicks instead of, uh, oh gosh, how many clicks do you have to make? I, I suppose the real answer is don't use Aurora and just use that, like that app. But, uh, you know, go to a class schedule, click, click, click. And then if you're using this on mobile and you click on this, uh, you tap on this subject listing, it, it selects all by default and you have to unselect all. Otherwise you get things from all departments and faculties. Okay, so I've typed now, I've tabbed, I've typed now, I pressed enter. Okay, so I had to click a bunch of times. So if I can say new Aurora is considered successful if I have to click 10 fewer times to get to my course registrations, then it's successful. That would be one way to make this into a measurable and objective success criteria. Any other points of view? We're all good. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Good, good. Uh, sideways, okay. I can deal with sideways. Binary bandits are on fire here. This is the last one. I, th I think this is measurable and objective because you can measure how long it takes somebody to do something. And I think it's objective here because you're very objectively saying 20% faster. So you're going to take measurements with the old app, and then you're going to compare those to measurements with the new app to accomplish some task. I wrote main task here because I, uh, this is contrived. Like I don't, I don't have a specific task that I want to say, but I would include in my success criteria specific actions that my user is trying to take to decide whether or not it's successful. Yeah? I think it's, uh, it's objective. Why is it objective? 20% here is no longer that distraction. It's no longer a red herring. We're actually able to say objectively, you can accomplish this task 20% faster than you were with the old thing. I've changed better to faster. That's the main difference between those two statements that we have. Better is, I've got no idea what that means. Faster means I can actually like pull out a timer and time you with doing this task and objectively say that you're 20% faster than before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so do you think like it can be also dependent on the person testing it? So for example, the first one, let's say the person testing was having absolutely no knowledge about the system and it took them more time. 
and the next one was more technical, and they were you know familiar with the system, and it took them twenty percent faster. So will it be still considered objective? So one way that you can change, so one way that you can address what you're what you're asking, I I think. So tell tell me if I'm misinterpreting what you're saying. But one, one way you can address what you're saying is to have different success criteria for each kind of user that you have for your system. So these highly technical devs, it's going to be better if they're able to do it just 10% faster because they already know how to do it really fast in the old system. This person that's never used my app before, uh, let's try it with the old one and try it with a new one. And it's successful if they can do it 50% faster. You might want to do that, but that would be almost too specific for the purposes of this course. But if you want to have like success criteria for different kinds of users for your system, that would be a reasonable thing to have. Yes. Yeah. We're good. Okay. Good. Good. Okay. Here's our podium. Team ten. Thank you. Binary Bandits. OK, great job, guys. Yeah, yes, yeah. Well done. OK, so let's move on. That's, uh, that's kind of the end of our discussion of non-technical planning artifacts. I'm going to give you opportunities throughout the term to revisit your non-technical planning artifacts. You are going to produce new non-technical planning artifacts as the term goes on because you're going to have to generate more user stories for each iteration that you're building this product for. I want you to revisit the non-technical planning artifacts that you've created throughout the term because after your first iteration, you might decide this was way too small. We have nothing left to do. This was way too big, and there's no way we can reasonably finish this this term. We have no idea what we're doing, and we need to limit the scope of the product or the project that we tried to put together here. I want to make sure that you have the opportunity to do that, to really reinforce the idea that it is OK to make changes to these things. It's totally OK to make changes to these things. But we have to move on and start talking about non-technical planning artifacts. We have to stop talking about non-technical planning artifacts and move on to talk about technical planning artifacts. So the vision and the features and the epics and the stories are basically a way for us to share what we want to build. Our clients are helping us create these artifacts and they're telling us what we want to accomplish. But they're not telling us things like, when are we going to do certain tasks? And they're not going to tell us when we're going to deliver working things to our clients. They're not going to tell us when we're going to deliver any working product to our clients. Agile, and I'm using the term agile here just to, to describe all agile methods. So remember that agile manifesto? That in and of itself is not a software development process. It's just a, a way of life. It's a way that you go about doing software development. Agile methods and processes are typically iterative. You build something small, you give it to your client, and you get feedback. They give you the feedback. You maybe make changes to course, so what you're going to be doing and building. And then you build some more and get some more feedback. And you just kind of keep going through the cycle of giving products and getting feedback about your products and changing course when necessary. In our course, we're going to be making releases at specified time intervals. And typically, if you're working in industry, you'll also be doing this. Every so often, so you're going to have a certain amount of time, you're going to just deliver a working product. It is not finished. It's not finished. And that's OK, because you're just trying to show your clients something that works, that solves some of the problem that they have, so they can tell you about what it is that you're trying to build. Release planning is going about and making decisions about the things that you're planning to accomplish during each of those iterations, each of those units of time that you have. Every release is going to be assigned a set of features. 
So you're going to take these non-technical planning artifacts that you've put together, and you're going to start trying to plan out when you're going to do it based on when it's going to be released to your client. When you're doing this, you're using priority and then dependencies between those tasks and features and epics to decide when they should be placed in your plan. So you should hopefully be able to start to see that some of your features just, they have to come after other features in the things that you've been preparing. You have to be able to create new users before you can start actually doing anything with the other parts of the system. The releases that we're doing are time boxed and time boxed means that they are time limited. They're going to be required to be delivered at a certain time in this course, but in practice, you're going to be just like, we're delivering this to you once a month. We're delivering this to you every month so that you can give us some kind of feedback. It's not finished. It's not finished and that's okay. You're just trying to release what's done. One of the things that you're getting out of this, we have this cadence, we're going to deliver something to you every month, is that your client gets to see progress. Your client gets to see something. You're not just kind of pushing it off and pushing it off and pushing it off until you happen to be finished this feature. You're just gonna release whatever is finished at the time of the cut. Here, this is what we did this time. Can you please give us some feedback about this? And that's not necessarily what you planned. You're going to create plans. You're going to create these release plans to describe when you're going to do things. And you probably aren't, <laughs> you're probably not going to get everything done. I keep saying this. I, I, maybe I've said it to you in class, like to all of you a bunch of times. I know I've said it to individual teams a bunch of times. You're, you're all planning too much. I guarantee it. You are all planning too much and that's okay. You're going to plan and you're going to say, we're all going to put this amount together and you're definitely not going to be able to deliver what you said you were going to be able to do. And that's okay. Everyone's in the same boat. Everyone is in the same boat. Alternatively, you might say, hey, we didn't have enough, so we had to bring in more stuff. And it's not necessarily what we planned because we could be just moving ahead into other features. Yeah. We are not releasing like, like what we have planned. So what do you think we already know what kind of feedback we're going to get because we're already missing a lot of things that uh, we know we're supposed to do but we didn't do, right? That's a fair question. So the question is, um, if we're releasing what's done and it's not necessarily what what's planned, the feedback that we should expect to get is it's not finished, right? The feedback that we're looking for when we do make releases like this that are not necessarily what's planned is, is feedback about what is finished. It's feedback about what you were able to actually finish. So your client, say, say you're able to build part of the user management system, you want to get feedback on that part of the user management system that you were able to do. This is also an opportunity for you as the dev team and the project manager to tell your client, this was way harder than we thought it was going to be. So the feedback here is a two-way street. It's not just going to be your client giving you feedback. Hey, this is terrible. You didn't do what you said you were going to do. The feedback is more like, wow, this was harder than we thought it was. And also, can you please tell us if we're doing the right thing with what we have given to you so that we know we're not going down the wrong path? Does that make sense? Good, good. For us, You've got very rigid due dates. You have due dates in this course. You've got due dates for this project. Every one of the iterations, so iteration one, so not zero, there's no release for you to do for iteration zero, but for one, two, and three, there's going to be a release that you're making for the product that you're building. Larger projects, so ones where you're actually out working in industry, they may have several iterations per release. So it might be that you have an internal client that you're giving this to, and then you're releasing it out to other bigger clients or more clients uh, in mass, as opposed to just one person. The goals that we have for our release plans and for our projects are release early and release often. And this is trying to fit into that agile lifestyle. So we want to deliver working software early, we want to get feedback and we want to fail fast. Fail fast here means we don't know what we're doing. Please give us feedback so we know where we're going. 
we know we failed. We know we're doing this wrong. Please help us get out of this situation by telling us what it is that you're looking for. We're going to build a release plan. I want you to build a release plan for the project that you're working on now. The way that we're going to approach this is to play this thing called the planning game. The planning game is where you are going to select a user story that you have created for your product. You're going to take the time now to estimate the cost. But, but wait, 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 we did that already. We did that. Your client did that. Your client was making some estimates about how long things were going to take. Now you are making estimates about how long things are going to take. You as a developer. So now you can take your user hat off and start thinking like a developer again. How much time is it going to take me to do these things? As a dev, you can also assign risk to estimates. This is a low risk thing because we're really confident about what we need to build. We've done this before. We know how to do it. There's not a lot of thought that needs to go into this. I'm just going to hack it out. Or it's a high risk thing because I've never done this before and I have no idea how to go about accomplishing that. Or it's medium risk because maybe it's in between those two things. You have some experience, but not a lot. Just by a show of hands, how many of you have taken Comp 3380 databases? OK. And 3020, HCI. Look around when I'm putting hands up here. Is not everybody. There's a good distribution of people across all teams, but it's not everybody. When you get to building your database part, the risk part might be high if you have people on your team or you have very few people on your team who've never done any database stuff. That's OK. When it comes to starting to build your UI stuff, the risk might be high if you've never built any UI stuff before. Conversely, it might be low if you've all built UIs before with, with Java or you've all done Android development. As you're going through this exercise of estimating the cost and assigning risk to, to stories, it's your opportunity to decide this is not the right size of a story. This is going to take too long. I need to break this into smaller pieces. Or it's a really high risk thing, but I can see logical separations between the tasks that I need to accomplish for that. Our customers are going to prioritize the stories. So our user is going to make a decision about what it is that's most important to them so that you can start to build what's most important in this app sooner. And then you repeat this exercise until you have enough to fill up a time box. Oh. I'm going to build a release plan. The structure for my release plan, we're going to have three iterations for this course. So we're going to be planning out three iterations. This is going to look fairly straightforward. I'm going to have a section for iteration one. And then I'm going to draw a big, thick line. I'm going to draw iteration two. And I'm going to draw a big, thick line. I'm going to draw iteration three. I'm going to put due dates on here, but I don't, I don't remember what the due dates are. I'm sorry. I don't remember what they are. So I'm going to put uh, February, March, and April. These are when we're going to have these iterations complete, or this is when they're going to happen. At this point, I've got this. I'm going to take this planning game, and I'm going to start. I'm going to start with features. I want to start with features, and I, I want to place approximately where I think a feature or an epic should go. And then I'm going to start going down into user stories. A feature may span multiple iterations. You may not completely finish a feature before one iteration is complete. You might only do a partial implementation of a feature. That's totally OK. 
user stories should fit within a single iteration. You're not going to have a user story that spans multiple iterations because they should be short. They should fit entirely within that. If when you are working, you are building something, you're working on a user story with your team and you can't finish the user story, then you don't release that work until the next iteration. So I'm going to put these side by side here. What your job is going to be with your team now is to create a release plan for your project. You can create a release plan for your project, or alternatively, if you don't feel like you have enough user stories and uh, epics or features planned, I have user stories and features for Notflix. So if you feel like you need something to go with further, if you need more stuff, you can take what I've got. Otherwise, just work on your own project. What I'd like you to do is uh, take your giant stickies here and draw this release plan on your giant sticky. If you've got post-its, if yours is up here, just come and grab it. If you've got post-its, just put numbers on the post-its. So if you've got a bunch of issues in GitLab that represent your user story, then just write those user story numbers on the post-it notes to stick onto your release plan. I'm going to give you a 10 or so minutes to do this. I'm going to come around and see how things are going. And then we'll all get back together again. Please go ahead. All right. So for the teams that I'm seeing, it, it's looking good so far. Uh, for iteration one, it's, it's, it's hopefully straightforward to start doing your release plan, basically because I've only asked you for user stories for this iteration. I've already sort of implicitly asked you to do this planning. Can I get you to stop for a second, please? Thank you. I've implicitly asked you to do this planning already by saying for iteration zero, you have to tell me about the user stories that you're going to do for iteration one. And ultimately what I'm asked, starting to ask you to do is to plan out a little bit further. So plan out beyond the iteration one that you've got right now. Ideally what you're going to do with this is, uh, is take this and Take this, I'm going to close that, take this and put it into GitLab somehow so that your team has this collection of when approximately we're going to do things. The options that you have here are to create more tags and labels. So labels for iteration one, these are all of our iteration one issues. It's to use things like milestones or it's to use things like um, the other, the board, the issue board in, in GitLab. It's kind of up to you to collectively decide as a team how you want to accomplish this, but you should have some way of distinguishing these are iteration one, these are iteration two, these are iteration three. Okay. So let's, uh, let's try and do one more thing here before we end for the day. Release planning is all about deciding when we're going to accomplish something. So... Visioning and everything is uh, telling us about what we're going to do. Release planning is telling us when we're going to do it. But we still have this like big question in our head of, when do we actually get to hacking on this project? When do I put my fingers on the keyboard and start typing code out? The plan that we've got is it's still really too big for us to do anything like that. Even user stories are too big for us to start thinking about what kinds of code we need to write. We also have lots of people working on this project. It's not just going to be us. We ultimately don't want our code to look like this. We don't want our project to look like this. The solution to not, the solution to the prevention of, only you can prevent this from happening. The way that we can get around this is to start thinking about how to organize the code that we've got. You all know how to code. You all know how to code. I don't need to tell you about how to code. You have all seen the word package before. You've all seen the word package before. And you were probably told several times to stop doing that. I know for sure in 2150 you were told not to use packages because I'm, I'm living that right now. And we're saying, don't use packages. Please don't use packages. Now I'm going to tell you, please start using packages. Please start using packages. 
I want you to now start thinking about how you're going to organize the code that you're writing. We're going to be using this word pattern, and we're going to see this word a couple times throughout the term. Now we're using it in the context of architecture. An architectural pattern is a way that we can organize code and a way that we can organize ideas about what we're implementing with code in an abstract way. When I was a kid, and uh, when I would go out for Halloween, I'd go trick-or-treating for Halloween, my mom, she'd always get a thing like this, a little, little package, and it came with sheets, big sheets of paper that were really, really thin, and there'd be like lines. Here's where you cut out the shapes of the fabric, and then here's how you sew them all together. I... Uh, I went out as a Ninja Turtle one year, and uh, the other one that's notable in my mind is that I went out as Frankenstein one year, and it's notable because my music teacher then told, called me Franklinstein forever after that. A pattern, so this is a literal pattern. This is a pattern that's used for building clothing. A pattern and a software design pattern is kind of a, it's a standard, it's a standard way to organize stuff. And this is a technical definition here. It's a reusable solution to a commonly occurring problem. So it's not a data structure. It's not a list. A list is a thing that you create. This is a way to solve a problem that you're going to commonly see. There are many different kinds of architectural patterns. This is the list of architectural. I love lists of lists on Wikipedia. There's a bunch of different architectural patterns that you can go through and think about and read about on your own time if you want. Uh, but I'm telling you that you're going to use this architecture for your projects for this course. We're going to be focusing on this one specific architecture that's called the N-tier architecture. The idea is that you're going to take the code that you're writing and you're going to separate parts of your code into different packages. So ultimately in Java, you're going to separate them into different packages, but kind of like separating them physically somehow. The separation is going to be going into tiers or layers. Layers is another word that's used to describe the same kind of architecture. And the way that you're going to organize code into these layers is that the code that's in this specific layer has exactly one responsibility or one kind of responsibility. So this is taking the idea of, I want to have multiple files. I have multiple Java files that solve this problem. And it's making it even bigger because now we're going to have layers and packages that have specific responsibilities for things. This is a diagram of the end-tier architecture that I have unceremoniously stolen from Wikipedia because it's way better than I could ever create. A three-tier architecture consists of three tiers, three layers. The presentation tier, this is where all of your Android code is going to be. You're going to have a package that's called something like presentation, and all of the Android-specific code is going to go into this package. So everything that you need to build the user interface for your Android app is going to go into that package. There's the logic tier, and this is what makes your app your app. So all of the things that are like constraints between data that you have for your system are all going to go in that layer. All of the things that are going to be like, you've got tutors and you've got students wanting tutors, the matching process fits into this layer. And then you've got a data tier. And the data tier is where all of the data gets persisted. This is the persistence layer. The main goal for separating this all out like this is that we should be able to just rip off a specific implementation of the presentation tier and put something else in its place. I should be able to take off your Android app and put a desktop UI in front of it, and I shouldn't have to change the rest of this. 
I should be able to take my data implementation and move it from a, a, a relational database like MySQL or something and replace it with a document storage system. And I shouldn't have to change my logic and I shouldn't have to change my presentation layer. That's the theory behind organizing your code like this. The data model that you create is going to be used across all three of those tiers. So if you have a user object, your data tier will have the responsibility of querying your database and creating a new instance of user. You'll pass that instance of user to your logic tier, which will do whatever it needs to do to it, which will then pass the user up to the presentation tier, which will take the user object and like dump out its properties on the screen. When you click a button on the presentation tier, it's going to send a request down to the logic tier to do something with a user object. The logic tier will send the user object down to the data tier and it will save the state of that user object. So our multi-tier architecture here, our n-tier architecture, also has data models sitting on the side that just kind of spans across all three of those tiers. We're going to come back to this on, uh, on Thursday and uh, we'll get back together with that. Can you please bring your uh, big stickies back up? And we're going to keep using them on Thursday's class too. Thanks all for coming out, and I'll see you on Thursday. Bye, everybody.